Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plan B Success. Who we have with us today is Chris Michael from Texas, the founder of Startup U, an interactive online learning platform for entrepreneurs. Take a business idea and turn it into a business. That's what Chris is focused on. You know, before he did that, while he was actually in college, he ran another business that was uh, pretty profitable, I believe. And he was in a moving company. That's what he did. He ran a moving company at that point in time. And then he also had health issues that he battled vigorously for about four years and then came back with a vengeance. So let's hear about Chris's story from Chris himself. Welcome, Chris. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. So tell us, uh, in your own words, how would you introduce yourself? Oh, goodness, man. I would say I'm a, a lifelong entrepreneur that didn't realize that that was a career path until about 25 years old and I was in a multi-million dollar startup. Uh, I love, passionately love giving back, teaching other people this beautiful gift of self-employment, uh, but also teaching them the nuance and the mechanics of how to do it successfully. Uh, the failure rate is far too high for entrepreneurs, as most of us already are aware of. And truth be told, we make it harder than it has to be. There's not much that we learn throughout our lives leading up to the, uh, the first or the genesis point of a first business. Uh, and I aim to equip people with that, that knowledge, that information that maybe is contradictory to whatever they learned in whatever form of education they have up to the point of starting a business. That's fantastic. So let's go back to your college days when you started your very first business. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, I, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. I just didn't realize that that was, I don't think I knew the word entrepreneur until much later. Obviously, entrepreneurship, I feel like in the last five years or so has become really sexy with Instagram and social media and what have you. But back in the day, this, as you know, uh, this, this really wasn't a, a prominent thing, right? So it was, you went to college, you went to high school to go to college to get a job. However, throughout my life, there's a lineage of businesses, if as they were, right, or, or side hustles or what have you, right? So when, even as far back as grade school, when my peers were at the pool and having fun over the summer, I was literally going up and down my cul-de-sac mowing everybody's lawn, made about $3,000 over the course of the summer in fifth grade. And so I just always really inherently understood the value of looking beyond the nine to five. Not that there's anything wrong with the nine to five. I don't want to discourage people from that. There's security and there's a lot of things wrapped up in that. And in fact, Many of my friends that have nine to fives, uh, I was actually quite envious of them because they were able to be very wise and, you know, go on vacations and buy homes and invest their money well before I was able to do those things. So there's a lot to that. And I couldn't do what I do uh, without the people that are committed to the nine to five to help my vision become a reality. So I want to make sure I'm abundantly clear about that. Uh, but, you know, these side hustles continued to happen, whether it was flipping clothes on eBay or buying and flipping cars or, I mean, I have a, a litany uh, of side hustles that I engaged with, albeit not recognizing that these were potentially lifelong opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. I got to college and it was more of the same. Uh, saw an opportunity as most of these ventures tend to take place. The, the good ones, right? I think everybody thinks entrepreneurship is about this like sexy new thing, right? And this awesome, like cool, whatever technology. And don't get me wrong, there are awesome ideas like that out there. I would say sending missiles to Mars and manned space flights, like that's pretty awesome, cool stuff, right? But oftentimes what you'll find is somebody invented the coffee sleeve, right? And they're making millions upon millions of dollars off a little piece of cardboard that goes on your cup of coffee. So it's just a matter of finding a problem and, and then deriving a solution from that problem. So in college, I recognized in this particular building that I lived in, uh, apartment community, off-campus apartment community, that it really wasn't conducive to moving in or out of. I often joke and say that the building was designed by a kindergartner with a crayon. So I saw these two girls that were, you know, my peers. I didn't know who they were, but my age girls uh, moving this, one of those fold out sofas down the hallway. Right. And there, I mean, I don't know if you've ever like really peeled back and look at the skeleton of one of those things, especially the older ones. But I mean, it's metal, it's heavy, it's, thin, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, so they're, they're weaving and, you know, running into walls and stuff like that going on the hall because rightfully so it's very heavy. So I grabbed my brother at the time we were really engaged in one of my side hustles was personal training. So I'd been spending ample time at the gym and I offered, we offered to help them just load it up for them. Well, their mom was joyous that we offered to, to celebrate, to, 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 to help them out or whatever. So she gave us, uh, she gave us a tip, better tip than I would have gotten in a full day's worth of work on a minimum wage nine to five. Right. Uh, so anyways, that kind of evolved into us eventually moving 30% of that entire building. Now, we're not talking a little tiny apartment community. We're talking thousands of units 
So in a matter of about a month and a half, we did about six to $8,000 in revenue. Just so happened to have my brother's friend had his, his grandfather's moving truck. And he said, yeah, grandpa says we can use it no problem. So it was very serendipitous the way it fell together, right? Mm -hmm. Well, let's fast forward a year. I'm now graduated. This was leading into my senior year. I, I'm off in the quote unquote real world. Got a straight commission sales job. I was traveling over the region in the Southeast. Well, my brother and his friend, friend with the moving truck, decided to do it the next summer. Was, Why not, right? They make good money, pay for the entire school year. They could just focus on their studies, not have to worry about making money or deriving income. Uh, so next thing you know, uh, they started pitching sorority houses, their, their classmates, and so on. They did like $23,000 over the course wow. of the entire summer, expanding beyond that one building that we had operated in. At this point, I realized I'm, I'm very unhappy. I'm selling a bunch of stuff and driving all over the place and making sacrifices and realizing I'm only taking a very, very, very small sliver of the pie for this massive, these massive deals that I'm landing of very notable brands, right? We're talking the Coca-Colas, we're talking big Fortune 100 companies that I was making these you know, sales deals with. And I'm taking home a tiny little sliver of that. And just really also recognizing that uh, my boss told me something that really stuck with me, my boss at that time. He said, you're not going to get respect in this business until your hair looks like mine. His hair is white as snow. <laughs> and I just said, not only do I not, my brain doesn't work to see the real value in nine to five, just because of who I am. I'm just weird like that. You know, and many of us are entrepreneurs. We just, we just, that doesn't work for us. But then also I got to wait 40 years to be respected. Like that, like there has to be a better way, right? I have to think more laterally in terms of my progression throughout my career. And here I have this thing, and albeit I didn't go to school, I didn't go to a prestigious university to start a moving business for all intents and purposes, but recognizing that that industry, you know, it was an ugly duckling industry. There's a lot of money. There's people that are always moving, but it's done pretty blue collar and not, there's not a lot of innovative disruption happening in the industry. So why don't we take a white collar, more innovative technological approach to the industry? So we were doing stuff that, I mean, you'd be shocked, like just incorporating systems and processes and technology. And uh, we were actually in, in the process of developing uh, little stealth cams that would go on our employees' hats that we could actually see at any point. We could see what was going on inside of uh, the, the person's home. If there was damages, we could we could have the actual video footage to see what happened. Mm -hmm. Same for what ended up becoming our, our, our furniture installation jobs that we were on. Uh, we could see what would happen if there were damaged claims. We could see that actual evidence. So. A lot of really cool stuff that we were doing. So that really took off within the next, uh, within the next six to eight months after I left that job and decided to pursue the moving company full time. Uh, I think within that point to about maybe 18 months later it was a multi-million dollar company. Now the big catalyst for growth, and I kind of teased that a little bit, was not just the residential moving, you know, apartments and stuff like that. Uh, but the big opportunity in that space was, like I mentioned, furniture insulation. Mm -hmm. So the trend in student housing at that time, and probably still is the case, uh, is the students move in, right? They bring their clothes and their whatever, their personal items. But the furniture, for all intents and purposes, is already provided, right? It's their fully furnished units. Well, they need somebody beyond the point of sale to actually do the inst installation and assembly work. So that's where we came into play. So we ended up doing those in about 32 states. At one point, I had 350 employees. I was probably 26, 25, 26 years old. I have, have no idea what I'm doing, to say the very least. Uh, and working with five of the seven major players in the turnkey furniture business for student housing. So that's kind of the, the natural evolution of what happened. But again, from inception to the point of hitting seven figures was about 36 months in totality. So it was a quick, very, very accelerated growth process. That's pretty awesome. So what did you study in college? What, were you, what did you go in there for? It's funny you say that because I, I really bounced around a lot with majors and what have you. I think I probably have more. I could probably share credit hours with like five people and still get a degree or multiple degrees. Um, so I, I went for business, right? I was in business school there. And then ended up, I ended up shifting to just a basic communications degree. And the only reason being was because um, I just it, it looked like that gave you a lot of different avenues. And, and at that point, I kind of was like, I just want a piece of paper to show that I did it. But I was really struggling to even finish the degree to begin with because, again, I was already starting to feel pulled outside of a more conventional path. And how did you juggle between the two? Between the two degrees or between? No, between the degree and the company that you were setting up. Whew, that's tough, man. Um, so there's a lot of internal conflict. Um, there was a lot of. So, so I think the hardest part, and this is advice I give to a lot of people, what I was trying to do was to live the life of a, of a hustler, right? So I would, so for an example, um, Black Friday weekend, I'm in my, uh, probably my junior year of college, a buddy of mine, his mentor is a couple years older than me. Uh, he had been, he had a friend at, at uh, Neiman Marcus, but knew some people at Saks Fifth Avenue. So mm -hmm. 
high end men's retail, uh, typically it is what it is, right? Like there's very few returns because with those, with those designer brands, they're very, the cut, the sizing, it's all very uniform, right? So mm-hmm. you, you know what you're going to get. So he found a kind of niche to be able to buy these high end designer clothings and to be able to bring them back and sell them on eBay, right? So he'd get massive, deeply discounted uh, items and sell them on eBay and pretty much double up on them because mm-hmm. you get 50% off if you find a good deal. And then if you spend over a certain threshold, you get an additional 25% off. So usually things on eBay would go for 50% of MSRP. So if you're getting 65, 75% off, you can do the math, you're doubling up. So we flew to, we flew to New York on Black Friday of like 2009 or something like that. And we bought $43,000 worth of clothing at Saks. We actually knew a guy there through his contact that let us in early before they even opened the doors, right? So we're in there and the guy had pulled aside items for us. So we just clean house, come back. Within a matter of weeks, we had flipped it, made $84,000. He used that money to actually start his, his business he runs now, which is basically selling like Bugattis and Ferraris and all kinds of crazy stuff. But he literally financed it through that. The cool thing about that was, it was actually no interest, no payments for 12 months. So it was literally like a loan to a degree, the way he utilized it. And I went with him to do that. I'm in the middle of college. I've got exams coming up. And I'm flying around, going to New York, flipping clothes and this and that, which obviously required a lot of hustle to be able to do that. So I really struggled with a university that required full-time commitment, full-time attention, but still doing all these things on the side. Some of my professors were great. Some of my professors, one of them, my accounting professor, I'll never forget her. She was so supportive. She said, call me when you made your first million because she just knew she disrespected what I was trying to do. She respected my industrious nature. Mm-hmm. Some of them, I would get demerits or I would get, you know, I would actually have an A as far as my grades, but I get a C in the class because of my attendance. I get doctor points because of my attendance. I was constantly missing the new, you know, there's an opportunity. And sometimes with the hustle work, you can't predict when that opportunity is going to happen, right? So you've got to go wherever the opportunity is. So I miss class here and there, but I always maintain my grades. What I should have done, kind of a long way to get to your, to answering your question here. What I should have done is find a, a school that was more of a commuter school right. or online studies or something that was more conducive to what my life goals were or are, right? So I think a lot of times what we end up doing is we, we, we enter into school. We don't know what we want to do. We assume all of this debt, right? And it's, it's kind of senseless, right? So I understand that you don't want to have this lag time between the time you graduate high school and go to college. But if you don't know what you want to do and you're not like, hey, my whole life I've wanted to be this. I've wanted to be a doctor or an attorney or whatever. I, and what I would have done is find a commuter school, find something that's going to be a little bit more of like a transitional process for you so that you are moving forward. If you decide that, hey, yeah, the more traditional routes for me, you can still go that route. But it also gives you the opportunity to be a little bit uh, to explore whatever it is that your other interests or passions might be. That's what I would have done differently. It was a very, very, very difficult juggle for me. And when, when did the health situation occur while you were in the midst of uh, standing up this company and running it? Yeah, so that kind of exacerbated the problem. Uh, but the problem actually, now that we've kind of traced things back, had actually spawned early grade school. I uh, just didn't realize it was a chronic ailment that had been misdiagnosed for many years, whether it was, um, you know, they thought it was ADD, ADHD. We had gut brain axis issue, uh, a lot of neurological issues that we were dealing with as a result of poor gut health. Um, so it had been misdiagnosed for a lot of years. A lot of the actual pharma- pharmaceutical drugs that I was taking actually even further um, kind of exacerbated that problem. It was kind of antagonistic towards the problem that I actually had. So, but, so you kind of look at it, you know, uh, you're getting to college, you're obviously drinking far more than you should, right? That didn't help. We're talking about gut health. Uh, and then now you're in a startup where you're basically just eating whenever, whatever you can, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, Hey, great. I'm busy. There's a lot going on. I'm working 18 hours a day. McDonald's is a great option or Hey, my monster energy, my resealable big monster energy, right? Uh, it's a drink, by the way, for those who don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know if there's right, right. monsters still around or not. Um, but I would just drink that all day. And that's my, that was my only source of nourishment. Stress doesn't help either. Stress typically will manifest in the gut in terms of physical ailments. So it, 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 I can't put my finger on one particular thing that's like this was the cause of my ailment. Mm-hmm. It was a chronic condition that worsened over time. And it really uh, came to a head uh, around my thir- right before my 30th birthday where I would just receive lab results that were pretty damning. Like you are not going to be around past 40 or 50 at the current pace that you're on if you don't really fully address this. So the startup absolutely was a, was a catalyst in the process. And that stress that comes with running a startup, managing cash flow. Growth sounds great until you experience growth. When you're not ready for growth and you, you, you can sell yourself to death, you really can. I almost did it. Um, and that, that experience in, in, in managing that kind of growth and not knowing what I was doing and having all the challenges that come with growth with running a bigger company now, 
an emerging startup uh, really is what kind of took, I think, a bad health situation into a, a terrible one. And you said it took about four years to, you know, st- get through your struggles on the health side. Yeah. So, you know, and, and that's very personal, right? So it depends on people as to how they would take something like that. You know, some mm-hmm. people can be very resilient and say, okay, I'm going to keep going, doing what I'm doing, but at the same time, take care of my health. And some people can just come down like a pack of cards. Yeah. How, how, how was your situation? Yeah, so I did both. Uh, so we knew this was a big problem. Uh, you know, the pushing through the, the first, the first, uh, scenario you described, we did that for about four years, maybe longer, maybe five. Uh, so we knew something was wrong. My girlfriend, who, who's now my wife, she would always tell me like, there's something really wrong. We need to get this. We need to get this checked out. But in my mind, and this is a really, really toxic narrative that entrepreneurs that we tell ourselves, everything's a destination. Success is a destination. Happiness is a destination. Wealth is a destination. Health is a destination, right? And so we're so committed to, to sacrificing whatever's required. And don't get me wrong, that mindset is essential to be successful in a startup. You just have to have your boundaries in place, right? And now I think what I've had to learn as a result of that, that was a really poor way to approach things, uh, is you, 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 you can't have those false constructs in your mind, right? It's like, yeah, but <laughs> there's a way to do, not do it all. I'm not saying you just need to juggle everything, but there's a way to say, okay, maybe we slow down the growth a little bit in terms of revenue, but we're also taking sustainable steps, right? We're taking affordable mm-hmm. steps. You know, we're not just selling for the sake of selling. We're selling, understanding our bandwidth and our current resources and then what the next steps look like, not just selling everything and then figuring out how the hell to make it work. That, that, that's not conducive to, to your own health and, and happiness, uh, but also towards be having a, a prosperous, sustainable business, right, that doesn't implode. So the first four or five years, knew there was a big problem, ignored it, just kept pushing forward, right? It's like, I'm young, I'm invincible, I'm bulletproof, right? No problem. Uh, then what we realized was as a result of that, my situation became so severe because we didn't address it, because I didn't find a way to have that paradoxical dance between managing those two things that I had no choice, right? My doctors were like, look, if you want to address this naturally, right? Meaning if you don't want to be on pharmaceutical drugs the rest of your life with a litany of side effects, this is what's required. This is the journey. It's a full-time commitment. It's a full-time job. Resources through the nose. I mean, we spent tens of thousands of dollars on my health just pursuing recovery, right? So, so I was left with no choice. It was that or we're seriously, really seriously looking at a very early death. Um, so I've experienced both ends of the spectrum and I would encourage people. I think we have a really, really bad, we have redefined what I believe to be um, a, a normal uh, level of health and wellness, right? Like the bar has been lowered so much across the board. I think we are so suboptimal in terms of health that we don't even realize it. Like what you're experiencing isn't normal. You being exhausted in the afternoon and yawning and having to drink caffeine, that is not normal human function, right? Like having uh, crazy IgG4 responses to things you eat, meaning inflammatory responses, that's not a normal response. You should not have that issue, right? So there's a litany of different things that we have in terms of health symptoms and signs that we kind of laugh about, right? Another one that's kind of a funny one is your, your flatulence should not be malodorous, right? You should be able to mm-hmm. break wind and, it, and in the room and nobody know it. We laugh about how it will stink out a whole room, right? And I know that's really TMI, but that's a huge sign of massive gut disruption that we just have accepted as a societal norm. Like, oh, well, you know, it stinks, right? It is what it is. That's not normal. Two out of 10 guts now are actually healthy. That's crazy. That's terrifying. And, you know, all, I believe all health and wellness starts in the gut. Obviously, I lived that, experienced that. And I, I saw how much I, I just rampantly improved when we start to address my gut health. So I worked with a lot of functional medicine practitioners. Uh, a lot of people, you know, maybe are dis- think disparagingly about that type of, of a pursuit. Uh, but I found it to be the most transformative form of, of treating myself that, that's humanly possible. So I think as entrepreneurs specifically, if you want to do big things, it requires big energy. In order to have big energy, it requires big health, right? It requires you to really, really focus on. Look at look at the Tony Robbins guys of the world. I mean, mm-hmm. Tony's got a, a a freaking little mini pool on the side of his yard. He gets in, it's, it's freezing temperatures, and he focuses on, you know, being able to withstand that. He does these crazy workout rituals. His diet is on point. The people that do big things, I don't know that any of them, that live on a beer and pizza diet. I just don't, like, I just don't think that's possible. The mind can only push you so far. We overestimate discipline, willpower, motivation, 
all of those things are a byproduct, in my view, and through my experience, anecdotally, are a byproduct of having a foundation in solid health and wellness. And do you do you follow that now? Like you know, with all that you've gone through, I guard my health and my wellness with my life. That that's the that's the best way to say it. I mean, I like I will not put. I don't drink alcohol. I don't, which I mean, that's, you know, that's a, that's a bare minimum for a lot of, a lot of people. It's just not even drink alcohol. But I mean, I, I'm a, I am what a, my people call me as a label Nazi. I mean, I, everything I eat, everything I consume, even if it's eating out, I will look at their menu. I will ask questions before I go about what they use to actually, it's not about the, the macro, right? It's about, it's about what they put in the food too. It's about how they cook the food, right? Mm-hmm. But where the food came from, all those various aspects. So to answer your question, short answer, absolutely 1000% yes. If you looked at my, my cupboard, you looked at my, I looked at our refrigerator, you'd be like, I, I don't, this person eats foods that I've never even heard of. <laughs> so, so yes, to answer your question, I, I have, I have, A, I've had to, right? It wasn't a choice, which made it, it's funny. It, there's even in challenges, there's opportunities. I don't know that I ever would have had the discipline to be able to uh, eat the way that I eat now had I not been faced with the challenge that I was faced with, right? Like if it mm-hmm. was just a, a, a voluntary choice, I don't think I'd be able to do that. But given that it was such a severe circumstance that was surrounding my situation, I had no choice but to change my lifestyle and my dietary habits in such a way. And now it's just become a habit. It's become part of my life and what I do. Uh, but yeah, it is the foundation of everything that I do. It is, I mean, everything I do revolves around really uh, uh, building my health up. So your current company, Startup You, you know, mm-hmm. what, what was your motivation to go with that? Uh, you heard it just now, uh, mm-hmm. my, my journey. Right. Mm-hmm. It was, man, I wish I had known that. I, I remember, honestly, I remember throughout my journey through, through any of my business endeavors, through any of the things that I've experienced. I remember far too often I thought to myself, had I known this six months ago, you know, had I known about this a year ago, had I, and unfortunately you're looking in the rearview mirror when now you've got to deal with, you know, you can say that and you can have, and those are painful learning. You know, they call them growing pains, not growing pleasures, right? So you can look back and say, in hindsight, man, I would have done that differently. But there just wasn't a lot of knowledge or resources out there, uh, albeit not mainstream, right, around, okay, but what if we can create an entire uh, community of entrepreneurs that have a reliable source to go to is they can learn these things before they have to go through and actually figure it out the hard way, right? Because the hard right. way is painful. Um, now, you, can, you can't synthesize it. There, there's no replacement for the actual thing. I have students and and clients that are what I call professional learners. I don't, it's not about reading the next book before you get started. It's not about the next course before you get started. It's about using those things, uh, as a, as a compass, as a roadmap, uh, as a tool in the toolkit, right? That, Hey, right now I'm about to start a podcast. It'd probably be wise for me to go through a podcast course instead of just trying to figure things out and realizing, Oh my God, I spent thousands of dollars on equipment and it was the wrong equipment or uh, I'm on the wrong host, right? Right. And so there's sunk costs involved with a lot of those things. And unfortunately, you can't recoup a lot of those things. So really what it came down to was I experienced, albeit a lot of success in that first business, it was painful success, right? It was unnecessary success. And moreover, there was opportunity cost, massive amounts. In 2014 alone, yeah, we made millions of dollars. I also turned away millions of dollars because I was not ready or prepared for that kind of accelerated growth. Had I been, I would have raised money. And honestly, here's the thing. A lot of it had to do with just my own financial bandwidth. Because we did not have, uh, we didn't, ha- we didn't have a credit card. We're doing millions of dollars because the, the the traditional big banks told me, even the local community banks told me, two years of tax returns. Well, I'm sorry, I can't help the fact that I grew a company faster than what two years of tax returns w- would allow me to do. Because at that point we had gone millions of dollars, right? And I still didn't have two years of tax returns because we were still a baby company. So I was like too successful for them to be able to give me even a, a line of credit, right? So it. it those things are things that I would have prepared for differently. I would have brought in investors. I would have made sure that I had salaried employees to be able to keep up with it. I would have had a controller, right? Because the, I, I spent 2014, 90% of my time I spent managing cash flow. Mm-hmm. Not because we didn't have, we weren't making money, but because all these opportunities required money. Growth requires cash, right? Mm-hmm. So I've got guys on the field all over the country and I've got payroll and I had $65,000 in this one particular instance, not to mention hotels, traveling fees, meals. <laughs> I mean, all these things were coming due. I had payroll in 24 hours and I had to come up with 65 grand not to count the travel expenses. So I'm flying. I remember I was on my way to catch a flight. I'm, I'm driving to JFK. I'm flying through. I'm, I'm literally driving through Manhattan. I'm on my phone. I'm literally, which is illegal in New York, by the way. Um, but I'm, I'm calling all, anybody that I can call, right, to try to get some temporary funding. Well, who do you know is going to come up with $65,000 to provide temporary reprieve for your, your 
cash flow situation. So we had had some things in place in terms of resources and I made it work and it was by the skin of my teeth, I made it work. But those type things, when you're not prepared for that, it doesn't allow you to be the best version of yourself and to be the best company that you can be, right? You're, you you kind of find yourself in the place of like, I'm a, I'm a startup, but I have real small business challenges or real business challenges and you're kind of in no man's land, right? So mm-hmm. that's just one example. There's a, again, there's a, there's a, a, an abundance of situations just like that, that that's what we aim to accomplish with startup you, right? So we're focused on providing education that maybe people don't have. That's why we called it you like university because th- you don't learn this stuff in school. You just don't. I mean, you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a degree and I promise you there's nothing you're going to learn. Uh, it's gotten better. There are entrepreneurship classes and clubs and stuff like that, but you know, there's nothing there, mindset, skills, mechanics, otherwise, uh, that are going to prepare you for what an entrepreneurial endeavor requires and or uh, for you to be able to use as an ongoing resource, like a continuity program as you are in the middle of your build. So with, with your current company, what, what are the offerings that you have? You know, I know the premise is how to find an idea and turn it into a business, but how, how do you break it down for, for uh, somebody who's interested? Yeah. So our flagship program is Startup Launch Factory, right? So think of Startup U as the brand, like Amazon. You don't buy Amazon, you buy the products that Amazon sells, right? So that's Startup U is just the brand. It's the name of the company. Mm -hmm. Uh, Startup Launch Factory is our flagship program. We're actually in the middle of a revamp right now. It literally takes you what I call a womb to tomb, right? So how to come up with an idea, how to know your idea is is a worthwhile idea to pursue. I see a lot of people pursue an idea because they think it's clever, but there really is no merit. There's no traction. There's no traffic for that particular search query, right? Uh, To analyze your competition, right? to figure out what your ideal client avatar is, to figure out what your marketing should look like, to building a sales page, to building uh, a landing page, to creating a lead magnet, all of, all the way up until uh, managing business partners, hiring, um, you name it, wound to tomb, we take you from the point of inception of this idea, we help you actually come up with the idea, all the way to probably making your, getting your first 100 customers, right? And actually making, getting this business off the ground. So that's our flagship program. It is, uh, I mean, it is, is extensive. Let's just say that it's 25 lessons. Each lesson is 20 to 30 minutes long. So it's hours and hours of content in addition to 50 plus resources uh, that I provided that are resources that I use myself, uh, in addition to, uh, three different bonus lessons that you have in that program. So that's a, that's a, a very robust program. Uh, but we also have other programs. Like I have a continuity program it's called startup books. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are, you know, big into learning. I'm looking, I've got a couple of my books right here. I'm rereading good to great by Jim Collins. So we actually include not just the read, uh, but also reading plans for specifically for busy entrepreneurs, right? Keep you on track for your read, but also coaching resources. I provide insights weekly uh, in that community, in addition to a live lecture at the end, which is an hour and a half long, which is basically me telling you, okay, here's the knowledge, but here's how it works for you. Here's how it applies for you, the entrepreneur, right? So that's uh, something we, we provide for entrepreneurs that we have hundreds of members in there that are reading every single month as part of that program. Uh, I have another one on podcasting, right? So a lot of people are using podcasting to build their business, right? It's a great, uh, some people make the mistake of building it as a business. I think you use it to build your business, right? So, so there's a, that's a huge paradoxical difference between, okay, I'm, I think I'm going to make money from advertisers or sponsors of my podcast, but there's not a lot of money out there for that. If I'm being totally candid, unless you're Joe Rogan, right? For, for, mm-hmm. for everybody else, even four to 6,000 downloads, you can have a hundred thousand dollar business if you're using it in a way to, as a marketing tool to build whatever business you already have existingly. So that's another program that we have. I have another one called the Unstuck Formula. It basically, basically teaches you, man, I really feel like I'm in a rut. I've been in this place for six months. I'm not making progress. The revenues are stagnant or I don't have any revenues at all. What do I do? So it teaches you literally what I use to make sure that I don't find myself feeling stuck, that I'm constantly have, not just here mentally, right? Of like, man, I need to you know push through this or whatever, but my actual mechanism that I use myself to make sure that you not only get out of feeling stuck, but also stay out of stuff. Did you continue to move forward? So it's, there's a, there's a, again, there's a, a plethora of different courses and offerings that we have in there and it is growing every single month. I'm in the process of creating a biohacker one right now. Uh, it's going to teach people the things that I know about my, about my health journey, right? You can't build superhuman entrepreneurs, which is part of the goal of what I'm trying to do without making sure that these people are, are really investing in their health and wellness. So that's another program we're getting ready to launch and you'll continue to see that as startup you continues to grow. And at some point it'll grow beyond me, right? It'll be, I won't be the only educator, right? We'll have multiple educators. Think uh, Udemy or Linda, where you can go and you can find courses about whatever you want to find. These are going to be specific to entrepreneurs. Eventually we'll have an app where you can actually just browse the store, uh, browse different courses and resources there. Uh, Could be courses, could be just 
whatever. It could be connecting with a mentor. There's a, a, a million different directions we can go with it, but it's going to be basically an online university for entrepreneurs continuing their learning and knowledge. And hopefully we can impact hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs if we achieve our goals. And there's a lot of self-help that I'm hearing, but is there any hand-holding in terms of helping somebody, like you said, you know, find that first set of customers, for instance? Yeah, so a lot, so a lot of it obviously is, like, I, like you said, it's, it's wrapped up in, in um, uh, self-study programs. Uh, however, one of the programs in it, this is, this, yeah, this is the first time I've said this publicly, uh, but one of the things we are going to launch that we realize is, is some people require, right? The people that are experiencing growth like I was experiencing. You really, pro you really maybe don't have time to sit down and go through a, a very extensive program, right? Because you're in the middle of growth and you need instant feedback from somebody. So one of the things we are launching is my VIP inner circle, which would give you access to either myself or one of my other coaches, somebody's involved or affiliated with me in some way, uh, where it'd be a group of 10, kind of like a mastermind where you're going to get real time, right? Uh, the ability to ask questions to somebody. One of the people I'm looking at is my business coach and mentor. He's had several hundred million dollar exits with his previous ventures. Having access to somebody like that, right? For me, has been a game changer, right? It is, it is increased my, my own ceiling tenfold, if not more. So that's something that we'll be doing as far as like actionable group coaching. And if you continue to see more interactive ways that we have people to engage with us. Awesome. And I believe you have your own podcast as well, correct? I do, yeah. So it's Entrepreneur Hour podcast. I will say, I don't know when this is going to be released, I assume in the next few weeks, we are in the process of rebranding it to the Startup You podcast just for brand consistency. So you, you're going to see it either as Entrepreneur Hour, which was the previous name. This was, we, I'm doing the podcast. That was my first uh, foot in the door to, to online business. Um, this was before Startup You was even a thought in my brain. So now we just want to kind of keep things in uniformity. So it will be the Startup You podcast, but currently it's Entrepreneur Hour with Chris Michael Harris. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. This has been a very inspiring uh, story that you mm -hmm. have. And there's a lot of ton of resources, looks like, uh, that people can have access to on your website. What would be a good place for people to find you and, and the programs that you have? Yeah, so the first step and the one that I really recommend, we like to diagnose people first, right? So if you've wanted to start a business and you're in the process of wanting to do so, I think the best thing we can do is help point you in the right direction. A lot of the clients and students that we come across what we find is that they really jumped into a business and they built uh, a business around their life instead of a life around their business, right? So what that means is they kind of feel like they're in a prison cell. Like they built a, a, a brick and mortar when they really wanted the freedom of a lifestyle business, like doing something online. So we help you figure out what types of business are best suited for your specific avatar. So there's five different business types that we've created. And we give you a list of businesses for each one of those that are best conducive to your profile type. So you go to cmhbizquiz, that's cmhbizquiz.com. Uh, you can take that quiz. It'll literally take you a minute and a half, if that, probably 60 seconds to get through that. You'll have an entire uh, PDF report you'll get as well as a video from me that's kind of covering that report. So that's where I'd recommend you start. Uh, you can go to Get Startup U. It's Get, like I'm going to do Get something. Get Startup U, U like university, uh, to check out our course offerings. Uh, but I really would recommend the assessment first. Obviously, you can follow me on social media at Hey CMH. Hey, like hello, Hey CMH. Uh, but I also want to say, uh, and it's Rajiv, right? I'm saying it right? Yeah. Yes, guys, please, please do this for me. Take 30 seconds, all right? You don't understand how hard it is and how much work's required to run a podcast like Rajiv is doing, right? It is, it is a commitment. It is in many ways a sacrifice to do this, to serve you in the ways that he's doing so. So what I ask of you is, since he's bringing you all this value, please take time to subscribe to his show and also leave him a five-star review, right? That'll help more than you recognize, more than you realize for him to get the, the visibility that he deserves for his time and effort doing this show. So I would, if you could do that for me, I would greatly appreciate it uh, for my friend here, Rajiv. Thanks for doing that, Chris. That's great. Hey, before I let you go, one takeaway for the listeners, anything that you'd like to say to them? Man, there's so many. Um, I would say the, the one thing is this. Um, entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. It's not a career, right? So, so a lot of the things that I see with entrepreneurs is they come in and it looks fancy and it looks sexy and it looks like this awesome lifestyle and Instagram and social media haven't really helped that, right? Where they see people on the beach and doing this and smiling faces and buying fancy cars and this and that or whatever. Um, you have to know that, that there's no doubt that that's an awesome motivator, right? Like I'm not, if that's what motivates you, fine. That, that's not what motivates me, but if that's what motivates you, fine. But here, but here's what you have to recognize. This, you don't turn it off at five o'clock, right? You don't check out and go home and just turn it off, right? This is a, this is a commitment. You have to buy into it completely. This, you don't dip your toe in the pool, right? It's full in, full immersion, head first. If you are, and that doesn't, that's not for me to detract you. 
I want you to have this life. I really do. And I think more of us have this ability to be, to be self-employed than maybe even what they realize. So I, I, I want to encourage you to do it. And I hope you do, right? I hope you continue, but have the right set of expectations and just know this is going to require every ounce of you way more than you realize. Uh, and, and it's going to be worth it, but it's going to be one of the hardest things you, I used to say the hardest thing that you'll ever do. And then I had some people that have been parents and they've been married and they said, well, I think marriage and kids have been harder than starting a business. I don't know. I only, I've only been married. I don't have kids, so I have no idea, but I will say that's what it's one of the hardest things you'll ever do is to get a successful venture off the ground. But it's also, at least in my, in my experience has been the most rewarding. So just know this is a lifestyle. This is not a career. Thank you so much for joining us, Chris, and we hope to keep uh, following you. We hope to keep in touch, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners will check out your website and your programs. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, man. Hey, I hope you liked that episode. Please do check out Plan B Success Podcast on your favorite listing platforms. It's also available on www.planb.live. If you're looking to learn how to podcast and learn everything there is to ideate, create, launch, and monetize a podcast, do get in touch through the website www.planb.live. And I'll be more than happy to help. Thank you very much. Thank you.